Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Sharon Weinstein. In our top story, Jerusalem will be dispatching the chief of the Mossad to discuss the Iranian nuclear deal with members of the Biden administration. Yossi Cohen will be the first senior Israeli official to meet with U.S. President Joe Biden. He's also scheduled to confer with his counterpart at the CIA and share intelligence Israel has gathered on Iran's nuclear program. Israel's Channel 12 TV released a report stating that the purpose of the talks is to explain the Jewish state's red lines for any nuclear deal the Biden White House might be considering. Jerusalem is insisting that the rogue Islamic Republic halt the enrichment of uranium, stop producing advanced centrifuges, and grant full access to inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency regarding all aspects of Iran's nuclear program. In addition, Israel is also demanding that Tehran cease supporting terror groups, end its military presence in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, and stop terror activity against Israeli targets overseas. A worst-case scenario for Jerusalem is the revival of the original Obama-brokered Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action Agreement, which allowed Iran to continue enriching uranium while receiving sanctions relief. France, Germany, and Great Britain have raised serious concerns over Tehran's use of advanced centrifuges to increase the purity of its enriched uranium. The E3 released a joint statement saying, Iran has no credible civilian use for uranium metal, which has potentially grave military implications. This comes as the head of Iran's atomic energy organization, Ali Akbar Salihi, boasted that Iranian scientists are producing uranium enriched to a purity of more than 20 percent, at a rate of half a kilo each day. This is just a short technical step from weapons-grade uranium, and Jerusalem fears that as soon as it has the bomb, Tehran will make good on its repeated threats to wipe the Jewish state off the map. The Israeli Knesset made the unprecedented decision to close Ben Gurion International Airport to all incoming and outgoing flights due to the rapidly spreading mutations of the coronavirus. The Jewish state has been working feverishly to vaccinate its population and so far has immunized more citizens per capita than any other country in the world. The vaccination campaign was expanded to include 17 and 18 year old students so that they can complete their end of the year matriculation exams. This is the first time that Israel's main airport has completely shut down. Previously, there have been limitations on who was allowed to enter the country, but the rise in variants of coronavirus from South Africa, the United Kingdom, and now California has forced Israel to take even more extreme measures in protecting the public. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explained that during the week that Israel hermetically closes its skies, more than one million people would receive the vaccine, bringing the Jewish state one step closer to herd immunity. Israel's Ministry of Diaspora Affairs is warning of an increase in anti-Semitism in 2021. In its annual report, the Israeli government ministry noted that Iran and anti-Semitic hate groups have blamed the Jews for having created, financed, and used the coronavirus to expand their global domination. They also accuse Israel of taking advantage of the situation for financial gain. In what the organization called an Iranian campaign of hate, the hashtag COVID-48 has become a forum for anti-Semitism online. This hashtag has been used 250,000 times, including in tweets by Iran's Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Omar Yankalevich, Israel's Minister of Diaspora Affairs, said that throughout history, the Jewish people have served as an easy scapegoat for the world's illnesses. She added that the current pandemic is no exception. A recent survey of United Nations textbooks for Palestinians reveals a curriculum of revisionist history, incitement to violence, and hatred of Jews. A report published by Impact SE, the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in School Education, noted that the textbooks produced by UNRWA include inciting material. These school books span all subjects and grades and frequently call on children to sacrifice their lives in defense of the motherland. One Arabic grammar book pays tribute to a Palestinian terrorist who murdered dozens of Jews in cold blood. The report also notes that the textbooks never mention peace with Israel, not even as a goal or an ideal. The curriculum does not refer to the state of Israel, rather it uses the phrases the enemy or the Zionists. 
A private residence belonging to a Hamas operative in Gaza exploded, injuring at least 30 people. Terrorists were reportedly assembling explosives to use against Israel when the bombs detonated prematurely. A spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces released a statement saying, the story of this house is the story of many homes in the Gaza Strip that are being used for weapon storage. He said, they have turned homes into warehouses of weapons, military parts and missiles for terrorist organizations, and the people who pay the price in the end are innocent civilians. Jerusalem has officially opened its embassy in the United Arab Emirates. Israel's ambassador to the UAE, Eitan Na'e, took up his post in Abu Dhabi last week in a temporary facility until a permanent building can be acquired. He's the first Israeli to be given full diplomatic status in the United Arab Emirates. Na'e previously served as the ambassador to Turkey until 2018, when relations between Ankara and Jerusalem began to deteriorate. Israel's foreign ministry praised the development of the opening of the diplomatic mission and released a statement saying the embassy will work to advance Israel's interest and will be at the disposal of its citizens in the United Arab Emirates. Just ahead of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a Holocaust Memorial Center in Israel announced the discovery of an underground bunker beneath the Warsaw Ghetto. Polish authorities have begun a campaign of urban renewal in Warsaw in order to erase the sordid history of the city. Major demolition work at the site of the Jewish ghetto in Warsaw has been taking place to prepare it for the construction of residential properties. It was during the leveling of the site that an underground bunker was discovered by Polish workers. Inside, they discovered 10 pairs of tefillin, or phylacteries, used by Jewish men during daily prayers. Some of the tefillin are more than 100 years old. The workers were contacted by members of the Shem Olam Holocaust Institute, who arranged to have them quietly sent to Israel, where the phylacteries were cleaned and restored. The white city of Tel Aviv has been named one of the healthiest cities on the globe. A report conducted by money.co.uk notes that the beachfront metropolis has one of the world's lowest obesity rates and ranks among the highest for life expectancy. Eitan ben -Ami, the director of the Tel Aviv Jaffa Municipality's Environment and Sustainability Authority, said the city's been working hard on a number of projects aimed at keeping the residents of Tel Aviv healthy. These programs include the launch of a municipal food program aimed at teaching parents and children healthy eating habits. In addition, the infrastructure of the city allows for biking and walking paths, as well as open-air exercise facilities. Archaeologists in Israel have discovered the first proof of an early Christian settlement near Nazareth. The Israel Antiquities Authority announced the discovery of an ancient church from the 5th century and a stone with a seven-line Greek inscription which dates to the late Byzantine era. The stone was originally laid at the entryway of the ancient church, but was taken and repurposed for a secondary use in a wall of a late Byzantine structure in the village of Taiba in the Jezreel Valley. An archaeologist with IAA said, The importance of the inscription is that until now we didn't know for certain that there were churches from this period in this area. The state of Israel welcomed 162 new immigrants from Ethiopia last week. This was the sixth flight of Operation Tsur Israel, which aims to bring 2,000 members of the Falash Mura home to Israel. The tribe of lost Jews was forcibly converted to Christianity generations ago, but have since returned to Judaism. They've been living in camps in Gondar and Addis Ababa, awaiting their return to Zion. The most recent flight of the 162 immigrants was funded by Karen Hayasod and was paid for by Christian donors. Sam Grundwerk, the chairman of Karen Hayasod, explained that evangelical Christians have made a significant contribution to the organization, and they have helped them to fulfill the prophecy of the return of the exiles to the land of Israel. He said Christians have supported Aliyah from the former Soviet Union, from Ukraine, even from Mexico. But there is something special about the way Christians connect with the Ethiopian Aliyah. We are living in mysterious yet miraculous times. We've witnessed the most remarkable fulfillment of biblical prophecy, the Jewish people's return to Israel, 
and the prosperity and contributions of this tiny country in such a short time. Yet we've also seen an unexpected rise in anti-Semitism, which takes the form of anti-Zionism and alliances between groups that are fighting against the most fundamental biblical values. In the book, Titus, Trump, and the Triumph of Israel, Josh Reinstein answers important questions to clarify what has driven political action from the time that the Roman Emperor Titus destroyed Jerusalem until today when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Get your copy today and learn how faith-based diplomacy has changed the world. To order your advanced copy, go to triumphofisrael.com. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Liad Elimelech. She is the CEO of Queen Sheba. Liad, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Liad, tell our viewers a little about what is Queen Sheba. Queen Sheba, from the Bible, which walked together with King Solomon, from my point of view, she was the woman who joined Israel and Africa together into collaboration and business success. And uh, 10 years ago when I came to Africa, I decided that uh, for sure I came to contribute to Africa, and especially to Zambia when, where I am located. And Queen Sheba was always in my mind, how do I implement this same idea in Africa? Everyone's talking about Africa-Israel relations today. Uh, we saw now the president of Malawi is talking about moving the embassy to Jerusalem. We're seeing a Christian bloc, Zambia, one of them, you know, Uganda, Kenya, Ghana, coming together and standing with Israel for the first time in history. Our prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, went to Africa twice in the last three years. Uh, no prime minister has done that in the last 50. Uh, so why so much focus on Africa? I think Africa is uh, very virgin. Okay, and many things can be done in Africa. It's a hub where we can contribute a lot from the development that Israel done in the past many years. And uh, bringing it to Africa for sure will contribute and develop the country much better than what it is today. So my idea when coming to Africa was to do mostly a knowledge transfer to bring technology, to set up a new hospital with the knowledge that comes from Israel, uh, to invest in agriculture, and to bring all the knowledge that we manage and train in Israel to Africa to see the success there. And today I can tell you from my experience in the past 10 years in Africa, many Israelis come there to build new hospitals, to invest in agriculture, to invest in high tech, and do whatever is needed for Africa to be a better place. You know, Africa used to take a lot of money from Muslim countries, and now they're becoming more self-reliant, and they're develop using Israeli technology to give themselves a competitive edge. How much is it important to Africa to have Israeli technology? Very much. I mean, you can see representatives from different countries. You see many people come from China, not only from Israel, China and Europe. If you come to Zambia, you see many, many foreign people that decided to stay there and continue and contribute. I think Israel is um, a leader in three main areas, agriculture, high-tech, and uh, anything that comes into security. And uh, Zambia government, for example, is one of the organizations that I work with them for many years and implement different uh, systems, you know, to move people to move from paperwork into technology. This is really a big challenge, but also makes me very happy to see that. 
So I think Israel bring different things than other countries. Of course, you see there are Chinese building new constructions, but I don't think anyone can replace the technology that Israel brings into this uh, land uh, because we are leading in this area. We see in Israel, though, that there's a big focus on Africa. A lot of companies are going there. A lot of politicians are working there. Why is it all of a sudden an important thing for Israel to have good relations with Africa? Israel is always looking for good friends and um, good potential to invest. Okay, Israel, of course, as you know, is small but making a lot of noise all around the world. It's surrounded with lots of enemies, if I may say. And I think the journey of Israel coming to Africa is to look for new friends, to look for new collaborations, to show how much Israel can contribute to these countries and a of course, to show the added value of Israel in this land. These relations are being pushed primarily by Bible-believing Christians. We're seeing Christians in Africa like never before pushing their governments to stand with Israel. How important is the Christian church in these new relations? I'm very active uh, with the church in Zambia, okay? I give you an example. Independent Day, we are doing a very big parade on the streets, come to church, talked about the Israel uh, wars, where we were and where we are today. And I can tell you that I met so many Christian people that are saving the Shabbat, okay? Looking for Israeli friends, looking, you know, they call us the Holy Land, where they want to be part of it, they want to come and visit Israel. There's a lot of tourism coming from Africa to Israel as well by uh, the, the church manage. So I think it's very much important, this collaboration. I don't see a big gap, you know, between church people and Jewish people because we are sharing the same Bible. Yes, we have Old Testimony, New Testimony, but the story is the same story. So I think these two, uh, Judaism and Christians, are so much connected and it's not surprising me that we work together and uh, help one each other. Now, you mentioned uh, there are many tourists coming from Africa to here, many Israelis going to Africa. How has the coronavirus pandemic uh, hurt this new relationship? Because we're not seeing the tens of thousands of Africans coming here. Israelis are not flying to, to Africa so much now because of it. How has this affected your work? When the corona started, it affected very much because nobody knew what is going to be. Everyone were afraid, and especially Africa people, you know, since they are facing lots of disease. Take, for example, the malaria. Every time it comes, then people are very much afraid to get affected. And when they heard about a new disease, the drama was even bigger. Okay, everyone are very much uh, following instructions in Zambia, for example. So it affected the business. There were two, three months where business was almost shut down in Zambia. But then I think the president took a very strong uh, step to open all the business areas in Zambia. And today, if you visit there, you see it's totally different from what you are facing in Israel. Liat, there are tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? I call everyone, investors, to come to Africa, to join forces, and to make Africa a better place for everyone. I know that Europe, Israel, America, there are many that come and contribute there. And just to join forces and help the African people to grow together with us. Thank you, Liat, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. 
I'm Sam Grundwerg, world chairman of Karen Aisod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Aliyah is the secret to the success of the modern State of Israel. Let's take a look at four different stories of people coming back home to Israel from around the world and see how they helped shape our great nation. For 2,000 years, through some of the darkest chapters in history, the Jewish people have dreamt of returning home to the land of Israel. During the last century, this dream has become a reality. Millions of Jewish people from every corner of the earth have arrived in the land of their forefathers. They have brought to life Zechariah's prophecy, I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Many have landed on Israel's shores with little more than faith and hope in their hearts. But with the help of Karen Hayasod, they have built happy homes and successful lives. And some of these new arrivals have become the leaders and pioneers building the future of the Jewish state. Sofa Landver was born in Soviet Russia in 1949, just as the Cold War was taking its grip on the world. Any public display of Judaism could prove dangerous, but Landver was determined to reach the Jewish homeland and eventually arrive in Israel in 1979. She has since dedicated herself to public service, becoming a Knesset member in 1996. Landver is currently Minister of Aliyah and Integration, helping Jews across the world make their home in the Jewish state. Michael Oren grew up in the freedom of New York, but he too felt the burning desire to return home to Israel, emigrating alone in 1979. Despite having no family in Israel, he fought as a paratrooper during the 1982 Lebanon War. Oren then built a glittering academic career, becoming one of Israel's leading thinkers, commentators, and authors. His prominence led Oren's appointment as Israel's ambassador to the United States in 2009, Israel's most important diplomat. Oren continues to guide Israel's future as a member of parliament today. Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. We need to band together to uh, assist those who are the neediest, uh, help absorb uh, those uh, who want to move to the state of Israel to be repatriated to their ancestral homeland and the integration process for them uh, will be challenging. And today I'm immensely proud to be part of that continuing epic story uh, of your involvement, of our involvement in making the Zionist dream not just a reality but a shining reality. Another Israeli ambassador to return to their country of birth is Belenish Zavadia. Zavadia was rescued from a remote village as a young child, arriving in Israel with no family, facing a strange new life all alone. Having graduated Hebrew University, she embarked on a diplomatic career. Zavadia has served the country across the world and incredibly returned to Ethiopia as Israel's ambassador in 2012. הייתה לי הרגשה מעורבת. אז עד אחד אני עוזבת את המשפחה שלי באתיופיה כי באתי לבד. ובצד שני, כל הזמן אבא שלנו והמשפחה שלי, כל הדורות חלמו להגיע לארץ ישראל, למדינת ישראל, והחלום שלי הולך להתגשם. אני מכירה את קרן היסוד טוב מאוד, את העזרה שלהם, את התמיכה שלהם. הם מפעילים את אולפן הציון. משם למדתי את העברית הבסיסית. עם זה הלכתי לאוניברסיטה, עם זה... עד עכשיו, זה מה שמשמש אותי, זה מה שבנה אותי. From Russia, United States, and Ethiopia, Sofa Landver, Michael Oren, and Elinus Zavadia represent a true ingathering of the exiles, as envisaged in scriptures. Jeremiah's prophecy, your children will return to their borders, is happening before our eyes. And with your support, you can ensure that Karen Hayasod helps many more make the journey home to Israel, guaranteeing that the dream of 2,000 years continues. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayasod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. 
Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. January 27th, the world officially commemorates the six million Jewish men, women, and children brutally murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators in the Holocaust. We remember this darkest chapter in human history, when a European country decided to adopt a policy and a program to exterminate every last Jew, mobilizing the full power of a modern, developed industrial state to implement this incredible nightmare. The mass murder of the Jewish people did not happen in a vacuum. For centuries, anti-Semitism had been all too prevalent across Europe, unchallenged. It grew and festered and then exploded. This oldest of hatreds had unquestionable longevity. Its roots stretched back to the ancient world. It was ever present throughout the Middle Ages. And yet, it exploded with full force in the modern era. And if people thought that following the horrors of Auschwitz and Treblinka, humanity would finally learn this, its lesson and rid itself of anti-Semitism, that it would throw it into the dustbin of history where it belongs, well, they were wrong. As prime minister of the country that was reborn after the Holocaust, the country that provided a homeland for the survivors, a state that rose from the ashes, a state in which the Jewish people regained their sovereignty and independence. I vow never to forget the tragic past and never to allow the Jewish people to once again be defenseless against the forces that seek our destruction. Never again isn't a slogan. This is our policy and this is our mission. The biblical prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The people of Israel are returning to the Promised Land. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Sharon Weinstein, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.